So what is shiny? So most of you probably know this. I'm not going to belabor the point. It's a web-based framework for interactive visuals. Um, so Joe Chang uh, was the main developer on this for a long time. Um, and now like our studio has kind of adopted it um, and they support it. So the one thing to kind of keep in mind with Shiny is that it is server-based. So it requires an installation of R that is web accessible to work. Um, and again, if you need to, if you need to know, find the link to these slides, the link is kind of down here. Um, I think I put it as a footnote for everyone. So why shiny? So I think you know there are a lot of um, good. There are a lot of good reasons. Um, so my, my like you. Know, I really thought like, you know, the, that um, whoever said making making data accessible to kind of non non technical people, I think that's a great kind of goal for shiny. Um, so I, I really kind of focus on the fact that it helps us build these interactive figures to help users explore data. Um, but we found that dashboards are really good for people helping people wonder about the data. They're like, well, oh, you know, we had this many more hospital admissions this this month. So what what was behind that? So it helps them kind of dive into kind of questions, so they can kind of come in with questions and kind of ask some of the data. Um, and my, I already mentioned that it leverages R in its visualization visualization tools. So before we get started with um, our Studio Cloud, I want to go through the basics of Shiny app architecture. This is kind of the boring part, but I found that it's really important to kind of go through this stuff so you everyone feels comfortable. And if there are any questions, please ask them in chat. Um, Martin will uh, alert me if I um, if I miss anything, but I'm pretty good at finding. Uh, um, asking or uh, finding the questions in chat. Um, or you can unmute yourself and ask, ask it right away. Okay, so this is this 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 comes from Vivian Peng and I just really liked how she kind of illustrated it. So these are kind of the basic parts of a shiny app. Um, number one, you always have to call the library shiny. Um, so you can load up all of the shiny components. And this is what is known as a bare minimum shiny app. And we'll go through all of these components in a second. Um, the UI, there's a UI section, which is it helps it tells shiny what to display on the web page. But when you actually ask um, when you're kind of changing controls in your shiny app, um, the, th the, the part of the Shiny app that is basically working is um, the server, the server kind of, and it does all of those kind of calculations. So say you wanted, you were asking um, the mean of a particular column. So that code would go in here. So the one thing that I found really weird about, Sh about Shiny when I was first kind of getting to know it was that Basically, both of these elements are running at the same time, and they are talking to each other. And that's going to be kind of the basics of what we're going to be talking about today is that, you know, understanding how these two UI components and the server component um, talk to each other. So once you have defined the UI and the server elements, you start up the Shiny app using the Shiny app function and you give it the UI and the server elements, and that will start the execution. Um, are there any questions so far? And I apologize if this is a bit slow, but I really think it's really important for us to all get onto the same page about this. So that was, I, I just basically took this and I just kind of made it into two columns. And so I think this is a little easier to see kind of, so we can see how these, diff these UI and server elements interact with each other. 
So just a couple things that I want you to notice. So we, we start out the UI object by calling this fluid page function. And notice that it's a function. Um, and this is what has tripped me up a lot of times when I'm writing shiny code um, is that the, this is a function. And so when you put things into the, the fluid page, the the arguments in this need to be comma separated, just like running anything else in a function. And we'll be talking about like the input um, and the output elements in a second. But um, so just keep that in mind. So the difference with server, so you can see server, the enclosing, um, the enclosure right here is their curly brackets. And what we're doing when we define server is we are defining a, a function that has these two arguments. So it always has an input and an output. But the main thing to notice here is that this is these are curly brackets, not, not parentheses. So this trips you up a lot. Um, so I just want to kind of point this out before we even get started, because it's something that is, that is kind of hard to see when you're first getting started. So I've been kind of dancing around. Yeah, go ahead. Was there a question? And if you're asking a question, uh, Kathleen, you're muted. I'm sorry, I wasn't asking a question. <laughs> oh, no worries, no worries. So we've got these two UI and server elements that they're basically running, they're continuously running, um, but they need to communicate with each other. So for example, you know, in, in the server element, we're going to kind of build it, we might build a something like a ggplot, but it, it just like without kind of um, sending it to the UI, it's not going to display anywhere. So this is this is I think the, one of the most confusing things <laughs> about Shiny. So let's go over kind of how they listen to each other. So UI listens to this output um, this output element. So like for example, this and so it listens to the output element, but it also passes inf information into the input element. So what does that mean? <laughs> so what it does is, so some of the things that the UI um, is responsible for are the controls in a Shiny app. So something like a slider or a drop down menu. So it, what it needs to do is when somebody changes one of these, so say they select um, a different value in a drop-down menu, it needs to pass that information on. And the way it does that is it passes it into this input object. Um, and so when it passes that in, and we'll be talking more about this flow in a second, but I just want to kind of Give you an idea of what's going on. So, but it's also listening to the output for generated plots and tables and changes. Server is kind of the uh, the opposite. So, it is listening for changes in, in in the input object, and it puts information into the output object. So, it passes on like so when like for example, if we calculate and we do a new GG plot it passes that on through the output object so that the UI can access it. But it also listens to the input object for any changes. So this is very, this is very confusing. Um, are there any questions right now before we kind of move on? And don't worry if this is not 100% clear, it'll, it'll start to be clear as we start writing code. Okay, and if I'm going, so you can also let me know if I'm going too slow, but I do want to kind of go through all of these concepts very clearly. 
Um, so I just want to introduce the data set that we're going to be working on. So this is a data set from the um, package 538. Has anyone heard of that package? <laughs> yes, no? A couple, or uh, one person has. So yeah, this is a great package that, um, so there is a website called 538.com. Um, they got the mo they got famous for basically doing prediction models of voting. Um, and you might remember that like the 2016 elections, they got completely wrong. Um, but until then they were actually doing really good, but they write all of these data-driven articles and um, my friend Chester Ismay, um, he helps kind of maintain this and Albert, and I can't remember who else maintains this, but these are all data sets that come from 538 articles. And this one is um, called Biopics. I just find it really interesting because it is about movies. I love things about movies. It has information for things like year release, um, the title, um, the name of the subject, it also has information about actors, so this was really made to ask questions about race and gender um, uh, in, in the movies and kind of representation. And it's actually a really interesting data set. Um, I've, you know, I've used it a lot of a number of years and I still find interesting things in it. So before we move any further, let's sign into our Studio Cloud. We're not going to do something right away. I still have to kind of go through um, stuff, but I just want to make sure that everyone has time to kind of sign into it. So I am just at the sign in, and I am going to sign into our Studio Cloud. And I, so you can see this is my student account, so there's nothing in it right now. So what I want to do, and I will paste this link into chat, I want to make sure that I go in and clone. Oh, thanks, Kristen, for adding information about the 538 data sets. Um, so this is the this is the link to the RStudio Cloud project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it. And I'm going to click this save a permanent copy. So since I am a student, um, I, this is going to clone it into my, uh, my workspace. Just a quick um, show of hands. Um, who here has used RStudio Cloud before? Okay, Rebecca. So it's, if, if you haven't, it's a little different than RStudio Desktop. So if there are things that are confusing about it, please let me know. But the main reason we use it is that it lets you kind of get started with the code right away. So is everyone, um, is everyone at this kind of part of the, so they can see that your workspace gradual underscore intro underscore shiny. So when you're ready, just um, give me a thumbs up. But I have, we've, you know, this is kind of a new, relatively new technology. Um, okay, so does anyone want me to pause for a second? Okay, so we just opened that up. I just want to get it ready to go when we, um, when we get started in a second. So we have this blank app. So we wanna, we wanna actually do something with it. Um, who here is familiar with ggplot2? Um, just give me a show of hands. Is there any, I think most people are, great. So this is just, it's just important because um, a lot of this has to do with how we are going to interact with this ggplot. So if there's anyone who um, is confused about the syntax, I just wanna make sure that they're um, able to ask questions. So 
let's just kind of take this apart. And I'm sorry if this is pedantic, but this is kind of how I, it, it really is how I think of these things. Um, so we're going to build a ggplot um, using our ggplot function for the biopics data. And of course, we chain things together with the plus sign. Um, some of you might not have seen this, but this is kind of, um, I kind of do this for kind of legibility. You can actually put this AES, this aesthetic function, as kind of a separate element. Um, I learned this, I think, from, um, uh, I can't remember her name. Um, she, her Twitter handle is Eva May Ray, but she uses it for the GG, I think it's GG Flipbook. But um, I find it a little easier to teach as well. So we are going to map our x axis to the year release, the y axis to the box office, and the color to the type of subject. And we're just going to make a geom point. So what we're going to do eventually is we're going to wire a control, and we're going to be able to change this column um, the column that um, we pass into the color, the, the color aesthetic. And we want, we're going to be able to change that with the control. So this is a little, I, the way I used to teach it was a little different, but you know, uh, I've gone through like Hadley's book, Mastery in Shiny, and he insists that this is, um, there's a change that I had to make that is a little more kind of tidy friendly. So Diana, did you have a question? And if you're talking, I can't hear you. Um, so if you do have a question, just let me know in chat and I will try to address it. Oh, I think you were you were just saying that you knew ggplot too. Okay, <laughs> sorry, didn't mean to sing, single you out. Okay, so this kind of gets into that the input and the input and the output objects. So just if we look on the server side, we need to to display a plot we need to use this plot output function and we pass it this argument called movie underscore plot and it's a character. So where does this plot come from? It comes from the server and you can see that we are actually assigning it into the output object. So it's output dollar sign movie underscore plot so this is this basically puts whatever we're going to um, we're going to put into this render plot statement into the output object for at, with the slot name movie underscore plot. And so I just want you to kind of keep in mind that there is a connection here. So movie plot and movie plot here. To actually make our plot, we need to wrap it in what's called the render plot function. And this is when I first encountered this, the um, basically this, uh, so it is, it is a function. So we have parentheses, but then we immediately follow it by curly brackets. Um, so why do we do that? We do that so we can actually pass in multi-line code. Um, if we didn't, we could only pass in single line of code. So that basically lets us pass in uh, our ggplot code. So this is our this is our ggplot statement. So we are going to do that, um, move that in there, um, and then. Uh, so it's just going to be in our render plot, um, and then we're going to pass it into movie plot, and then our UI is able to display it. Um, so let's go into well, let's let's go into cloud, and we can just do this first part. So 
Um, shoot, where did it go? Oh, here it is. Okay, so we are going to open up App Basics, uh, 01 App Basics, and we are going to open up this 01 App Basics.rmd file. So this is um, an, this is just an R Markdown notebook. So I kind of stumbled on this approach of teaching Shiny using R Markdown. Um, I think it's a little easier to understand, but um, you can let me know. Uh, so there are there is a video. So if you want to go back and refer to the video, you can um, basically run this code block. And it will basically bring you up to the video um, to this point. So if you kind of want to go back and review this, this is kind of an option. It's kind of built into the. Um, it's built into Shiny. So I just want to talk a, a little bit about these three libraries. So we are lo loading the Shiny library, we're loading the ggplot library, and we're lo loading the 538 package to get the biopics data. So this V and better library that is just it just lets us kind of view the videos. So you don't need that for when you're actually building an app. Okay, so strangely enough, you can actually build an entire shiny app within a code block. Um, so you can this can literally be run. Um, so this was our very minimal Shiny app. And you can see that we had a pop-up, but there's nothing there because we haven't put anything there. <laughs> so, um, but it is a Shiny app. <laughs> so um, this, this is um, just ignore this, this um, error because it, this is just basically, um, you just need to close down that window to stop the app, um, but it's just going to give you this error. So going back, um, so this is this is the plot that we wanted to add. So I am at uh, line fifty nine here. So this is just that GG plot that we were looking for, and so this is just that plot that we want to put into our Shiny app. So I just want to pause. Are there any questions? Am I, is everyone doing OK? OK, great. So I'm going to scroll down. Um, so this is this is just what we were talking about um, before we kind of moved on into cloud. So this is our um, this is our our shiny app. So we you can see we have our plot output function, and it is displaying this um, what's in the output um, in the slot called paired plot. This is where we're passing in our plot into our output object. So if we uh, click, the, click the run current chunk, you'll see now our app has a plot, but it is just a static GG plot. So we wanted to make this more dynamic. So how do we do that? So I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, so we're now on slide um, 20. It says uh, 1.3, let's add a control. So now we're going to add a control to our app. So this is the control we want to add to our, um, to our app. And it's called a select input. So all of the kind of different inputs, like a slider or everything, they end um, that you, or controls that you can add to a Shiny app end in input. So this one is called select input. And we are going to put an, uh, it requires what's called an input ID. 
and we will um, use that um, in a second. So much like the output had an output ID of the um, of movie plot, we are going to pass in um, the information um, for the in, for for the select um, into this input this color underscore select slot. So this argument label that appear that basically gives the the um, element a title and choices. So this is actually a vector of column names. Um, and I'll show you where that kind of comes in in a second. But when you base this basically specifies everything um, that you need to run the control. So you can see in this drop down menu, we've got uh, four different columns that are column names in our data set. Everyone doing okay? Okay. So, like I mentioned, because fluid page is a function, <laughs> to add a new element or select input to our to our UI, we have to add a comma after after the after the first element. So we have that plot output element. Now we're adding this select input control. So now we, we have that information. So our user is going to select one of the columns and it's going to, our app is going to react by changing the column, um, the column that we're going to color, color the, the dots by. So there are different kind of categorical variables in our um, biopics data set and we want to give them the power to kind of change the color. So how do we want, like, we need to somehow get that information into this AES, this AES um, of our render of our ggplot. So how do we do that? So, and this is where I was having some problems with formatting, but I want you to kind of pay attention to this. I find this this is kind of the new way that Hadley Wickham recommends. I used to use an other, another way that was a little easier to understand. But one thing to realize is that we access our we access the value of our select input using input dollar sign color select. So that is going to return a character. But if you're familiar with ggplot, you notice our AES function. It doesn't. It, these aren't characters. These are actually name column names in our in our um, in our data set. So to transform this character into a column name, we have to use this data this data notation and. Well, I'll talk about this a little bit in a second, <laughs> but this is kind of the new style. So um, it's dot data, and then to pass in our column name as a character, we have to use this double bracket notation. I'm not a big fan of this, um, but I guess this is the new way of doing it. So um, any questions about this? But the main thing is that we are specifying the column name using, so we're taking our the value from the input object, the color select, and we are pulling the column um, name using this dot data notation. This dot data notation, so this actually exists as an object in all of the tidyverse. So when you are piping a data set through something, and you don't know how to refer to it, you can refer to it with this dot data. I, I have found this to be very confusing. So I am totally, I totally agree if you are finding this confusing. 
Um, so Rebecca, so we entered this on line 212. Well, we'll get there, just a second. <laughs> So let's just talk about the flow. Um, and this is, this is something that I find has been really helpful in really understanding um, how, when you change a control, how does it change like the code? How, how does the code react? So a user will basically uh, use this dropdown to select a column name. And that gets passed into this input object that the server can access. And then we basically generate a plot using that information. We put it in the output object, and then we display it with the plot output box, um, box plot. Sorry, I, these names are all kind of confused. This is an old figure, so these are not the same. So I just want to mention a little bit more about why we use that dot data double bracket notation. Um, so again, we need to take the value of our select input, and that is a character value, and we need to use it to actually refer to the column name. So this, like I said, this dot data um, shorthand is a way to kind of refer to the data set. Um, so that is kind of how you basically map in a character value into, into an AES statement. It's not pretty, but that is kind of how, this is kind of the new accepted way to do this. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this, so this is a section in Mastering Shiny called Data Masking. So this will let you know uh, more about this. Okay, so I know Rebecca seems to be a little um, uh, ready to jump the gun, but we will kind of get into this. <laughs> so hopefully we will get, we will help. So here we're just basically adding this is um, this is our UI, and this is where where we are adding our select input code. And you can see that I have added that code into the UI right here. So this, this is just that, this is just, so if we run this, you'll see we have a control, but it doesn't do anything. It's because we haven't wired it into the, into the ggplot. So that's what we're going to do next. And again, if you run an app and you want to close it down, you just hit the, hit the close button here. So now I'm down. Um, I think I'm closer to where Rebecca is. Um, so we need to connect our select input to our ggplot. So this is, a, this is an exercise and I want you to basically fill this out. So this is what Re Rebecca was referring to. So what do you put in this, this, um, this, this blank space here? So let's give everyone just a couple minutes to do that. And when you have figured it out, just paste the answer. You don't have to paste all of the code, just paste what's in the blank into here. And sorry, Rebecca, I didn't mean to um, single you out. Anyone have an idea for what we should put here? Give you a hint, it starts with input, dollar sign, 
what happens after the the input dollar sign? Yes. So, so yes, page, both page and Kathleen are correct. So we need to put input color underscore select. And just to review, we know that that we need that value because it, it the select input has that ID of color underscore select. So notice that this is not in quotes or anything. Um, it's just dollar sign color select. So this is now a complete shiny app. So we can run this. Oh, I think I screwed something up. Just a second. What's going on here? I know this one works. <laughs> Okay, so this is why I have backups. Uh, I made a mistake there. Um, so the correct answer is underneath that notebook. But you can see when we change our category, we change our drop down. The the categories, the category colors change. So this is the subject underscore race column. This is the subject underscore race uh, subject underscore sex column. And you see it, our plot now responds dynamically. So I will go back and check that, but at least you have the, 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 the real answer. Did, did everybody, oh, is it because it's missing line 240, so. I think you are correct. Let me check. Line 240 plot output. Uh, no, it's actually right here, but for some reason, this is not, I, I need to go back. Oh, I am sorry. This is, I went, this is the old way of doing it. This should be AES. I apologize. This really should, I should have, I thought I fixed this everywhere, but I had to just make this work. Um, so what I did was I, instead of AES underscore string here, I changed it to AES and I removed the quotes from all of the aesthetics. So this should work. So if I run this again, Um, it's arranged a little differently, but you can see now it works. Did people did people get it to work? Yes, no. Okay. Okay, I, I'm seeing more successes than than not. <laughs> Does anyone want me to go over that again? Okay, so thank you for speaking speaking up, Laura, and I will go over that again. <laughs> so this originally and this. This originally was AES string. And it had quotes. So I like everything, all of the aesthetic, the variable names were in quotes here. So I just took out the, I made, instead of AES string, I made this AES. And then I took out all of the quotes 
um, for the step, the column names. Is that a little more clear? So Lauren, uh, Lauren, to answer your question, AES string is not bad, but from what I understand, it is going away. It's going, it's deprecated, and they are encouraging people not to use it. Um, I used to use it all the time because it actually makes things a lot easier. You don't have to use this dot data notation, but just to know that it is going, they're trying to get rid of it. So that's why I'm showing you this new way. <laughs> so it's not bad, but just in future, future versions of Shiny, it may not work in ggplot. So good question. Um, just a note, so just talking about um, UI element, remember to separate each of the elements by commas. I make this mistake all the time, so don't feel bad if you make this mistake. Um, just look for a missing comma. But um, it is also why I think this is also kind of one of the hardest things is like, you know, some of these, some of these uh, UI functions are nested. And so it really helps to use something like the rainbow rainbow parentheses. Has anyone used the rainbow parentheses in our studio? Okay, so this is a new thing. So I think I believe it's under the code. Um, and if you just scroll down, you'll see this this um, option called rainbow parentheses. So if you select this you'll see that different levels of, and this is kind of hard to see with, um, here I'm going to change my, I'm going to change my color scheme so it's a little easier to see. I wish you could just set a, set a default, this is the color scheme I usually use. Um, I'm just kind of a dark mode kind of person. But the main thing is that it lets you, like the columns, in terms of kind of their nestiness <laughs> or level of nestedness are colored. So for example, you see this, this, um, this kind of brown, brownish, I don't know if that's the greenish brown. Um, basically, you can see the uh, the corresponding corresponding um, bracket down here, and this is this is really helpful and is also colorful. So I kind of like using it. <laughs> so yeah, so this is like you know I, I spent a lot of time trying to think of ways to make the, make this programming process easier. So. When someone, I think it was um, Allison Hill showed it to me. I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Anything, anything, any other questions before we move on? Yes, it is perfect for Pride, Pride Month. <laughs> I think they kind of, there, there must be someone at our studio who is a friend. <laughs> so let's, this is, um, we are kind of at the top of the hour. So are people opposed to taking a five minute break or are people okay with that? Oh, okay, Kristen, I will go over that again. So it's under code. And you just scroll down to here and it says rainbow parentheses. So why don't we take a five minute break um, and just kind of refresh your coffee or whatever you need to do. Um, if you have any questions that you wanna ask, I'm, I will be here and Martin will be here. Although I'm not gonna force Martin to be here if he needs to bio break or anything, but we will get to your questions. <laughs> okay, see you in a little bit. See you at two o'clock, that is.
Yeah, so um, just to answer the question, uh, so there was a question about rainbow parentheses. So it is a fairly new um, part of our studio. I think it was part of 1.3 or 1.4. Um, so it's, it is, depending on your version of our studio, um, it may or may not be available, but. Um, Yeah, I understand, Diana. Like I have to deal with, I, I used to have to deal with IT too, and it was kind of a pain. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. It is worth. It is. I, I think it does. It is worth um, maybe dealing with <laughs> dealing with IT a little bit. So it, I, I think it, it is one thing that has really kind of helped me a lot. Um, and I think especially I've had students that are, um, you know, they're, they are mildly dyslexic. And I think that helps them a lot too, because they need like kind of cues to find it. And like, that's what I, that's the one thing that I find really kind of challenging about this is like the nestedness of the functions. <laughs> And Kristen, no, IT is not all bad. They're, they're good people. Okay, so it is now two o'clock. Um, we will get started again. And no worries, Rebecca. Um, uh, all of this is still is also going to be available on the website. So if there's anything you miss, um, you can catch up on the website as well. Okay. How's everyone doing? Great. So this, the, I, I apologize if this was slow for some people, but I really do want to kind of emphasize there are a lot of kind of concepts when you're getting jumping into shiny and I just kind of try want to try to introduce them at a slow pace just because it takes 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 some time to kind of wrap your head around it. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the slides. So now I am on slide 27 and it's called making data reactive. This is um, one of the most confusing things about Shiny. So it's, we'll, we'll go through it kind of as slowly as we can, but just if it, it does not kind of settle in the first time, don't beat yourself up about it. Kind of take a break, go back and read, read, read the slides again, and hopefully it'll, it'll gel a little more. Okay, so one of the things we do in the tidyverse very often is that we um, do we basically use dplyr statements, and so we can we can do this. Um, so here I'm just taking the first five rows of biopics, and I'm filtering by the year release column. So I want year releases that are great um, greater than 1917. So this is great, this is static, but we wanna make it dynamic using what we know about Shiny. So we will learn about how to do this. So like the idea is that we will have a slider and it's going to change the value of this, um, of our year. And um, we will make it uh, basically make what's called a reactive data set. So the first thing we need to do is we need to wrap our data set in what's called this reactive function. And this is called a reactive expression. And this is very specific to Shiny. Um, you can see that it, is start, it starts with the um, parentheses and then brackets here. And, in, and here we have taken basically our, our ggplot statement and we have wired in our input dollar sign year underscore filter statement. So every time this control changes, this the, the data set that is returned by this 
is going to change. So what does that mean? <laughs> Let's, we'll get into it in a second. Any, any questions so far? And again, I've, I've found this to be like one of the most confusing things about Shiny. It will become more clear what's going on when we actually use it in the ggplot2 statement. So what happens is I just want to kind of go, this is kind of the behind the scenes of the flow. Again, it's useful to kind of think about this. So what happens is that we are changing a slider input and we are putting that into this dplyr statement. And by wrapping it in this reactive function, we make this a dynamic data set. So this data set basically will react to this, to the value that we put into the slider input and it will change it will change this value here. The trick with that is that you basically you have there is a new way to kind of refer to this dynamic data set. And you can see that we have a, a ggplot statement here, or actually I didn't have enough room in there, but we are calling this my data. Um, so to, to call that reactive data set, you have to use these parentheses. So let's add in our control. So this is just a slider input. Sorry, I wanted to put a little graphic there, but I think I forgot. So this takes the same input ID and it takes a title. But here, like you'll notice that these are numeric values. So min, um, we're going to say is 1915. So that's going to be the lowest value on our slider. Maximum is 2014 and we'll set it at a initial value of 1915. So here we're, and we're going to not talk about, this is, we're, we're just focusing on the slider input. So I know the code doesn't have the previous um, select input, but we're, we'll add it back in a little, little bit. So this is our, we're adding in our control. And again, remember, we need to have our commas here. So sorry, I just realized the layout makes this a little confusing. This is not UI and server. These are both in server. So this is where we are defining our reactive, our dynamically changing data set. So it is called, we're calling it biopics filtered. So when we have, we, we basically can use our same, oh God, and I forgot to change this to AES. I thought I got all of the things, but um, I'm sure it is changed in the code. But so just notice that instead of biopics, we're using biopics underscore filtered. That's our dynamic data set. And we always, to actually call it, um, we always have to use these double parentheses afterwards. It's confusing, and this is a mistake I make all the time is I put in the name of the reactive and I forget the double parentheses. But this basically is our dynamic data set and our ggplot function will react to that. So it basically, we um, dynamically filter our data and that data gets passed into our ggplot and then like a new plot is going to be rendered. Oh, so Re Rebecca, what is the difference between min and value? So good question. So min is, that's the minimum value that's displayed. Value is the default value of the slider. So um, sorry, I, I could just, that was a little confusing. Um, so this would be kind of the starting value of the slider when you kind of open the app up. It's going to start at 1915. Is that more clear? And it'll be, well, I'll, I'll explain it again when we get into the code. Okay. So again, this is a mistake I make all the time. Like if you're using a reactive data set, um, there are actually a lot of different kinds of reactives, but I'm really only going to cover data. Um, you have to use these parentheses. 
Um, this is a, I just added this because it's actually helpful. And I think I put this in the final app is this rec function. So one of the problems is if this, if this value is not specified, say we didn't put a default value for our slider, then the reactive is not going to work and the plot is not going to display and it's going to display an error. And it's like for your user, they're going to freak out. So what we do is like before we use the reactive, we use the rec function to require that an input exists before it executes the code. Um, so this save, um, and that'll be clear when we kind of get into, into the notebook. So let's go back into our studio cloud. And I am going to just go back one. So I was in 01 app basics. I'm just going to go one up. So into gradual shiny. And we're going to go into the 02 underscore reactives folder. So let's open the 02 underscore reactives dot RMD file. So I'm just going to run the setup chunk. So this is just kind of reviewing that we want to make a dynamic data set and we want to basically make our filter statement dynamic. So now I'm at line 40. So I'm just adding in that slider input. And notice that we haven't defined our reactive yet. So I'm just showing the, I'm just showing that we're adding a slider into our. So you can see we have the control, but it's not wired to anything. So nothing is going to change. So again, this is the the DG the dplyr statement that we want to make dynamic. So we need to put that into this reactive, make it reactive. So this is the exercise. So what I want you to do is I want you to wire the slider input into the reactive by using the correct ID to input. So you need to find the value that you need to use here. And then once you have that, you want to call the biopix filtered um, data set. So um, when you are done, um, just give me a thumbs up um, and then I'll ask if people have figured this out. So let's take a couple minutes to do that. Uh, so Edgar, so the question is the interactive goes into the server. Yes, it always has to go into the server. And the way you know that is because it's making some sort of calculation. So it has to go into the server. Good question. Do I have to turn on rainbow parentheses for, that is kind of annoying. Why can't it just be a def maybe it's a default option under options. Um, but yeah, I had to turn it on again. So if you were missing rainbow parentheses, that's why. So anyone have an idea for what should go in this part? So input dollar sign. Yeah, so Paige says your underscore slider. Are we in agreement with Paige? 
not to put her on on the spot. Okay, we have agreement. So I'm going to make this year underscore slider. What goes here on line 127? Oh, and darn it, this has a yes string again. You try to follow kind of the, the best practices and it just kind of bites you. So again, I'm going to remove, make that an AES, AES string. So what goes, yeah, so good question, Lauren. So AES can actually live outside of the ggplot statement. Um, and I didn't know this until, um, God, Gina, her name is Gina, and I can't remember her last name. I am sorry, Gina, but um, she showed it to me that you can actually put the AES on the other side <laughs> or outside of the <laughs> outside of the ggplot. And I, I like it because it's, it helps you kind of build things up. Um, her, like, if you've seen the GG flipbook package or the, I can't, Oh, it's called Flipbook R. Um, it's just a wonderful package for teaching ggplot because you can build things up a single, um, it basically will build a flipbook. And if there's time, I'll show you what that looks like, but it's a really, okay. So Trent has asked, Gina Reynolds, thank you very much, Martin. Um, so she is awesome. Uh, is it safe to assume that I could use reactives to create a slider to change the dates and use a pre, Yes. So in the end, we will combine both of these techniques and there's a final app that you can see that uses both of them. So what is going here? Is it just biopics filtered or am I missing something? Okay, Lauren says that um, I'm missing the parentheses. Okay, so let's try it out. Eh, okay. Just give me a second, I just need to confirm. Oh, if you're having issues, this should be year release. I will make notes about all of this. It's not year, it should be year underscore release. So you can see that um, as we kind of make increase the value, we see more of the data. And as we kind of move the slider down, we see less of the data. So if you wanted to, you'll notice that like, you know, the scaling is kind of is dynamic as well. If you don't want that to change, you can put in a scale function and set the minimum values. And then like when you change the, when you change the slider, like, you know, it will basically kind of You'll, you'll see that the, the upper and lower values don't change. Yes, thanks, thanks Paige, thank you for... Where can we set the X axis to date format? Um, I believe it is a scale, I, th I think it's a scale underscore X underscore continuous function but I don't know, oh, for the slider. Okay, so I'm also getting, so I'm going to close this down. Okay, so.
sorry, I'm just scrolling through all of the, where can we set the X axis to date format? Um, oh, the slide, okay, the slider information. So I am, I don't know that right offhand. Um, I believe you need to use a scale function in the ggplot. So I think it's, this is where I get into trouble. Um, I, I'm going to address, so Rebecca, are you still having errors? I just got it, thanks. Okay, yeah, great, I, I, great. I deleted too much. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to do. So um, that's why the answer is always below. <laughs> um, so you can kind of compare your, your results to that. Again, darn it, I used a, a string. I, I thought I will fix this. I'm sorry. But this this will run. So you can see. Um, did, was there anyone else? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of catch up with Lauren. I'm not exactly sure what she's referring to. Oh, so, okay. There are many arguments in the slider input function to control things like number formats. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, and thank you for posting that link. Yeah, I know that probably is bothering a lot of people. <laughs> I am a little OCD that way too. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Lauren. There are any other questions that I missed? Sorry, there are a lot of there. Are, I'm just trying to kind of keep up with chat. Okay. Everyone, everyone okay with reactives so far? So let's just do a quick kind of review. So reactives are a way to make an, ex, an express, so technically it's an expression, but in our case, we're making a data set react dynamically um, to our, to, to us, to an input. Um, and basically, so we need to wrap it up in our reactive. And here, this is where I put, remember we were mentioning that rec function. So this reactive is not going to run unless there is a value in the input dollar sign year underscore filter slot. So, and to use our reactive, so we define our reactive using this reactive function. And we use the reactive by putting the name of the reactive followed by parentheses. Okay, so we made it through the majority of the workshop. So Pat yourselves all on the on the back. I mean, you, you all have been really great through all of this. <laughs> so now I'm going to kind of show you more of the, the fun stuff about Shiny. So here, who here has heard about tool tips? Oh, sorry. So Edgar has a question. So with the ability to have a lot of inputs and outputs, how do you manage to fix errors with all of the lines of code? Yes, it is. It can be challenging. There is a way to simplify things. Um, I don't have time to teach it. Um, it's called Shiny Modules. And it makes things a lot simpler because you are just kind of building kind of individual UI server elements for small parts of the app. So that helps you a lot. Um, a lot of the times I am literally, um, I try to make the simplest version of when I'm adding something to the app. Okay, so Rebecca said she's used tool tips, but also always filled like the output has extra stuff listed that I don't want to show. So we will we will get to that. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the slides. So now we are on slide 37. 
adding tooltips with Plotly. Has anyone used the Plotly package before? Yeah, so it is different enough from ggplot um, that it is not easy. It like learning the syntax is brand new, so it can be a little annoying to work. So I'm going to show you a way to turn a ggplot um, object into a plotly object um, with one function. So if you haven't heard of Plotly, it is a JavaScript library that makes your interactive plots more interactive. So such as adding tooltips. So like if you moused over like a dot in your um, in your uh, plot, like you can get more information over it. So this is we use the Plotly package in R. Um, Karsten Sievert uh, maintains this. Um, he does a great job with it. So. How do we make a how do we make a plot a GG plot into a plotly plot? So this is just our this is just our code that we are assigning into the my plot object. So once you have that, you you just you, I try not to say just because that's not a good thing to say. You wrap your your object in the GG plotly function. And this is what happens when you map it into the ggplotly op. So you can see now that we, like when we mouse over different kind of dots, we get more information. And I don't, there seems to be a little bit of a, don't know why the um, tooltips are a little kind of crazy right now. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I think it has to do with the size of the plot, but it should work. <laughs> Um, so this is a, this is um, extremely just, you just need to know kind of one function and you can um, basically start producing these plot plots. So if you wanted to add more tooltip information, you wanted to add more information from columns that exist in your data, what you can do is that you can you can see, like, you can see we're passing in these fake aesthetics. <laughs> so if, if you are familiar with Geom Point, there is not a director aesthetic. There is not a box office aesthetic. There is not a subject aesthetic. But here, they're just kind of, this is just how we're kind of passing in, um, passing in the column names that we want in, that to be displayed in our tooltip. So you can see now, um, and I don't, uh, that, sorry, that's just bothering me that the mousing, mousing doesn't kind of correspond, but you can see now we have all of that information in the tooltip. So just to review, um, to, add, to add more tooltip information, you can add in this, add in a fake aesthetic in your AES, statement. Um, so it's just easier to use the um, same name as a column. Um, I the one this is the one thing I'm a little weak on in plotly is formatting formatting these values. Um, I point you to like the section in Carson's book um, that talks more about this. I wish people would just post like a really simple way to do this, but um, you have to kind of define a new, uh, I think it's a, a function that writes the HTML for the tooltip. Um, and in the, there you can like change the formatting in it. Can we rename the display of the column name and the tooltip sim similarly to renaming labs and ggplot? I think so. I think so. <laughs> we will, let's try it in a second. So are there any questions about Plotly and ggplotly? <laughs> yes, I understand, Lauren. It is a little, I, I have to say, because it's JavaScript, it's a little, it's a little R unfriendly. And I have kind of spent ways to try to figure out best ways to do it. Um, I will, 
like if I find some something on Stack Overflow that like helps people. Oh, okay, great, great question, Avril. Um, so ggplotly is a function that lives in the plotly plotly package. And what it does is it takes a ggplot and it transforms it into a plotly object. So you don't need to use the plotly code. So you, if you've ever used plotly, it's like plot underscore ly, and then it's you pass in all of the function names and, and things like that. Um, this lets you skip that step of having to learn a brand new way to kind of write your ggplot, your, your plotting code. That answer your question? Okay, great. Okay, so how do we actually add Plotly plots, Plotly plots into our app? So you need to make two changes. So instead of using plot output, you need to use Plotly output. And instead of render plot, you need to change that to render Plotly. So this is us kind of making those changes. Um, so you can see I have the plotly output instead of plot output here. So it's our movie underscore plot. And we make this function render plotly instead of render plot. And this is just the code to generate the plotly object. So let's get back into cloud and open up 03. So 03 tooltips underscore plotly. And this is just the final section and we'll do a little wrap up. So this is just, again, to show you um, that we need to assign our ggplot into an object to use it on the gg, to use the ggplotly function. So I'm just assigning our ggplot into my underscore plot here. And you can just generate a plot uh, a, GG, a plotly plot using that. And here the mouse scene seems to work better. I have no idea why it's not working in the slides. Um, so yeah, so that that's kind of, and the the nice thing about plotly is that you can use them in R markdown HTML files and you don't have to have shiny running. So you can send somebody, the like the single HTML file that has the plotly plots in it, and they can still do the tooltip thing. They just can't do like the dynamic filtering or the dynamic coloring. So this is a trick. Um, so if you only want to show certain things um, in the tooltip, you can pass it um, in the ggplotly function. You can pass it this tooltip argument. And this is a character vector of the column names that we want to display. So if we do that, you'll see when we mouse over, we only show year underscore release and box underscore office. So let's add it into the app. I don't think I made it. Oh, OK. So um, this is just the, this is like a, an app that uses Plotly. I don't think there is a control in there. It's just a plotly plot. But this is to show you, you can um, basically add, uh, this is how you add a plotly plot into Shiny. So what I want you to do is I want you to add in more aesthetics into your ggplot um, AES string statement. So down here, these two blanks. And you can use um, you can do things like movie title. So the way the format is the left side is a column name, and what you want to call, have it display in the tooltip is on the right in as a character. So this is just here, so it gives you all of the column names. Um, so why don't you try that out? Um, so you don't need to, let's, for right now, let's just delete everything after my plot. Let's just de delete the tooltip argument. And you can, you can basically modify this.
So just pick a couple of column names to add um, information. So any of these you can add in. Wait, did I get that wrong? Huh. Oh, no, that's that's right. So I'm just going to add a couple of columns. I'm going to add number of subjects. Oh, and again, I think I This shouldn't be, sorry, this shouldn't leave it. This should be correct. So I'm just going to test this out. Oh, okay. I got it backwards. So the column name should be on the right side. And you can change the title name over here. Sorry for the confusion. So you can see we added in our number. Why is it, huh? I thought it was supposed to have the aesthetic name as a title, but that doesn't seem that so you can see we just passed in and like the name for that is number underscore of underscore subjects. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that, but at least you know how to kind of pass information into a tooltip. So this is this is just kind of the final app for this section. So this is this just an example. I think I added the, I think I added the select input back in here. So uh, sorry. So there are, this is kind of some of the column names in this are weird. Um, like they have, I don't want to say weird. They have international characters and I did not set the locale for this. So if you're getting that error, that's what's going on. But um, I will show you how to fix that in a second. Yeah, so uh, apologies for that. I think I need I think I need to set the locale to China because there is some China there are some China names. Um, I didn't put it in here, so I... now okay. So I need to find the the bit of code that sets the locale for that because this data set has Chinese characters and shiny, that is one thing about shiny is that it's not good at dealing with, um, dealing with like kind of foreign characters. I shouldn't say foreign international characters. Um, I, will, I will figure out what that statement should be and I will fix it. So just wanna kind of conclude things. So the way we've been running apps and code blocks, that's not standard. <laughs> so if you notice, if you look in all of the folders, you'll notice that there is a file called app.r. And this one is not going to work, but um, it is basically what's, what's happening here is you can see that all of our code, this is just all of the code that was in those code blocks. 
but it needs to live in a file called app.r within a folder. So you can run it, you can run it using this run app button that's in this top, the top right of the code window. This is not gonna work because of the local locale issue, but um, I think, let me go, let me show you it for in two reactives. So you can see that this is a full working app. What's supposed to go after tooltip online? Oh, okay. So I changed that line 114. So tooltip, it, you can pass that. So it tooltip. It should be like column names that you want to display. So it's a character vector here. So if I wanted to just show gear release in the tooltip, I could do that. Or if I wanted to do type of subject, So you can see that's how you can kind of control what information you're displaying. Yeah, thanks for pointing out. Yeah, that, so that is a string you need, you need that Diana just pasted in to set it to China so it, it works. So I will add that. And this is a problem is that they, all of the files are called app.r. <laughs> So I'm going to just add that into this. So again, that sets your locale to China, so it's able to process Chinese, Chinese characters. And it now works. Yay. <laughs> OK, so let's just do some wrap up. Um, this was, this was kind of all I really wanted to cover. Um, and thank you for getting through it and asking questions. Hopefully it's been helpful. Um, so there is a full version of the app in the zero underscore full app folder. And just to kind of show you, and I apologize if I'm going fast, um, this integrates both the slider input and the select input and the plotly. So this um, basically integrates everything that we've learned today. So you can see, you know, or it, we can move the slider, we can move the country, or we change the categorical variable to color by, and then you can see we still have, we have the plotly. So that's just kind of there, so you can kind of see how we put it all together. Okay, Rebecca's asking, so deploy an app for use by others. We use an R, so it's, it always needs to be called an app.r file. Um, and when you, so I'm going to talk about deployment in just a second. Um, just to, this is how you instantiate a new shiny, shiny app project. You, uh, you go under file, new project, new directory, shiny web application. And then you have to name the folder. Um, and then it will create that app.r in that folder. Do the tooltips always stay with the plot? Yes. So that's the nice thing about Plotly is that the tooltip functionality um, basically can be used independently of shiny. So you can put that in an R Markdown HTML. If you have an HTML document of some kind, you can um, just have a Plotly plot. There are some JavaScript um, functionality for doing the filtering, but it's pretty limited. There's a package called Crosstalk, um, but it's, it's kind of cool because you can link uh, multiple visualizations with it, um, but the filtering is pretty limited. So 
if you want to do filtering, it's probably you probably will have to do it in Shiny, or you can only do simple things um, with crosstalk. And I think it's a little it's a little heavy on the resource usage. Okay, so let's just wrap things up. Um, just want to point you to the Shiny widget gallery. So this has all of the different kinds of sliders and inputs, like you know, select buttons and things like that. And it gives you code on how to use it. So it's a very useful link. Um, we just looked at the fluid page layout. Um, I actually like, um, there's another layout um, uh, package called Flex Dashboard, which I like a lot more. Um, it does require a slightly different setup for your apps. Um, and you can read about that here. So going further, I think th this, this is probably, this is the hardest thing is like, you know, um, this is always kind of what I call, uh, what everyone calls like drawing the owl. So like the, in, the beginner instructions show you how to draw a circle. And then the next step is drawing the owl. <laughs> so you see like that. And I think that is kind of a problem. I've been thinking about kind of more intermediate kind of tutorials, but I just want to, I want to point you to kind of the, some of the extensions that are really useful. Um, so there was a question on making like making your code a little more manageable. So you can use shiny modules for that. Um, if there are JavaScript libraries um, that you want to use, check to see if it exists as what's called an HTML widget. So th these are these are made for um, the basically will take JavaScript visualization libraries and let you use them in R and also shiny. And also there is this package called R2D3, a uh, cute name, whoever came up with it. Um, but it, this is like, if you have a, somebody gives you a D3 visualization, it lets you basically take data in R and put it into an R, a D3 object so you can display it. And if you've seen a lot of the cool plots, those tend to be in D3. Um, Plotly is actually written in D3. Um, there is another list of kind of where, where to go next. So let's talk a little bit about hosting apps. So there is a website called shinyapps.io and this is where you will upload your apps so other people can access them. Um, so I think the free account, you are only limited to cert a certain number of users and usage like something like 16 hours, I might be wrong, or 25 hours of users using your app in total for a month, but there are kind of paid plans. And the question was about deployment. So this is, I, I wanted to spend some time covering this, but this is actually its own thing, but the documentations, for shinyapps.io are actually really good. So this will set you up everything you need to do to publish your um, app online from an RStudio um, installation. So again, like we didn't learn all of the flashy things, but like, I feel like you should at least have enough, um, hopefully enough confidence and knowledge to start learning from the examples and the gallery. And the best way to kind of go further is to look at other people's code um, and start with the simple stuff and start um, kind of getting more and more kind of complex. Um, this is, these are just a couple of tips. Um, so try to compute, pre-compute as many statistics as possible in advance if you can. So don't, like, you know, for example, if you need to calculate means of something, um, it might be better to kind of pre-calculate that and have that as a value in your data frame um, or, and try to work from one data frame if possible. So if you can merge your data into a kind of a single monolithic data frame, it is a lot easier to write shiny code for that. Um, 
there are ways to kind of dynamically update the UI. So for example, if you selected a certain column name and you wanted to kind of change, um, you can change, you can like on that, that's called a, an event and it lets you, you can actually dynamically update the UI. So like it could display, like you have a slider input and it goes above a certain value. Um, it would add a new kind of um, control in um, when you kind of reach that value. So those are called event handlers. And I think I mentioned HTML widgets before. So just kind of um, wrapping up suggested reading. So both of these are excellent, um, Mastering Shiny um, and Carson's book, um, Mass Interactive Web-Based Data Visualization with R, Plotly, and Shiny. So just some acknowledgments. So I've given this work, this is probably the sixth time I've given this workshop and it's gotten better every time. So thank you for kind of sitting in, like I've noted a lot of, you know, the things that you're like, you, the questions that you asked, that's always excellent for me. And I use it to improve the workshop. Uh, so I should have put, um, used bullets for this, but this is just my information. So just keep in touch, you know, um, I'm happy to ask question, answer questions. I like to ask questions too, but um, anyways, and I think that's it. So are there any other questions before we kind of adjourn? Great. Glad, glad you learned you learned something, Rebecca. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I need to I need to go back and learn more advanced shiny stuff, but spend a lot of time kind of working on this and like the different concepts. So, great. Okay, so if no one has any questions, um, we can adjourn and have a good rest of your afternoon. Um, I'll stick around for a little bit in case anyone has any other questions. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's Martin here. I'll stick around too. Um, I just wanted to um, reply to something that uh, Diana raised during the break around uh, the the life of. Uh, I understand that you're employed by a government agency somewhere, uh, and the challenges in getting your IT approvals. Um, so I'm just going to post um, a link in the chat. Um, this is a kind of the long form text version of a talk that I gave at the EARL uh, Enterprise Applications for the R Language Conference that was held in Seattle in November 2018, uh, where I talked about the experience for myself and BC Stats in kind of dealing with some of those things, right? Like you mentioned, it takes forever to get the latest version of R installed on your computer. So that was part of my life. So um, that's there for further entertainment, uh, should you wish. And uh, right. yeah, if anyone uh, wants to reach out, uh, I can uh, post some of my contact information as well. Thanks, Martin. Thanks all for being great students, and I will see you all at the conference. Thank you. Yep. Have a good afternoon. Ah, well, that went pretty well. Um, I need to stop recording. I think I forgot to stop recording during the...